This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie, and today I'm talking with Magat Wade, who was born in Senegal and is director of the Center for African Prosperity at the Atlas Network. She's the founder and CEO of many companies, including Skin is Skin, which sells a series of, series of skin products. And she's the author of the new book, The Heart of the Cheetah, How We Have Been Lied to About African Poverty and What That Means for Human Flourishing. Magat, thanks for talking to Reason. Nick, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So uh, let's. Uh, what's the elevator pitch for the book? The elevator pitch for the book is what you said. You know um, how we've been lied to. Uh, how we have been lied to about about African poverty and what it means for human flourishing. So basically, so many people around the world um, have been appalled by why Africa to this day including many Africans, mm. why Africa to this day is still the poorest region in the world, despite, you know, all of its riches, mm -hmm. uh, starting with very young population. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. But uh, I, when it comes to that, I realized that uh, almost no one, you know, puts on the table the right diagnosis as to why that is the case. So the book is about what is the right diagnosis as, well, as to why this continent is still the poorest in the world, and then so 80% of the book spends time on that because we need to make sure that we got the diagnosis right so we can have a good solution. And then 20% of the book goes on to solutions. And then from there, from having read the book, then we invite people into our cheetah generation movement where we're actually taking all the concrete steps that uh, the solution sparks talks about. Let's uh, talk about that kind of the controlling metaphor of the book really is the cheetah and the, the cheetah generation. Um, you know, a cheetah is obviously an African animal. Uh, it's it's pretty cool. Where does that term come from and what does it signify for you? Yes. So the reason why I am cheetah everything is because of uh, my beloved professor, George Aite, a Ghanaian economist who we lost earlier this year. Um, and he taught for he, many years at American University in D.C., I know. He taught um, for many yeah. years, exactly, and was part at some point, I think, of, of a Brooklyn Institute, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. So anyway, so Professor Aite, for me, I think for people to understand why, um, why him, why cheetah and why all of this. You have to understand that back in 2007, I was back then a um, young, you know, TED uh, fellow. We were actually, us, the African fellows, were the first TED fellows. We were the, the, the cohort, the first cohort. And so as that, basically, they went around and they, um, they, you know, the people of TED and their ally and the people who worked with them picked a hundred Af young Africans from back home in the diaspora everywhere that they felt really this cohort of young Africans are really onto something and they're doing amazing work. Most of us were entrepreneurs, but you also had artists, all various type of creatives. It was wonderful. So they take us to TED. It was my first time at TED. You know, we were in Arusha in, in Tanzania. And, uh, you know, there were people like uh, Larry Page, Sherry Brain, um, Bill Gates. I mean, everyone was there. Uh, everyone, you mentioned, um, of course, Bono was there, right? Bono was there. Yeah. Everyone was there. Everybody really in the world back then that was somebody was there. Because Africa was hot, they were like, "Let's see what we, you know, let's yeah. see how we move this thing forward." And so, um, uh, you know, basically, at, and me, I was there, and you know, I was an entrepreneur already, working in Silicon Valley and all of that. I was, I was still very much, um, if you could qualify me that way, I was very much still a lefty, you know, like um, because I was also a do-gooder. So, not that the two can be conflated, but anyway, that was more me, and I was barely at this idea that. Um, Aid is fine, but trade is better. I was still fine even with aid, uh, foreign aid. So that's where I was, you know, but um, definitely starting to be served by reality in terms of, uh, you know, like what dots connect and don't connect. Right. And so here I am. That's a mindset I walked in with. And then this was the first time though in my life that I heard uh, people being so articulate about um, the disasters of foreign aid. The, the reason why, you know, just being so vocal about it and Africans, not not non-Africans. There were like people like Andrew Mwenda, people like George Aite, but him, his talk really grippled me because when he was talking about, so what George's title, the title of his talk was Hippos versus Cheetahs. And very much he was making this uh, differentiation in mindsets. It was not so much about age, are you African, non-African, but it's about the mindset about, about Africa and its uh, path forward. And he had, um, he had made this di differentiation between the 
hippo mentality. These are the people who still believe, you know, uh, that colonialism sets us back. People who believe that slavery, um, even though we're out of it, <laughs> sets us back. Um, and when you put them all together, it's more or less the victimhood mentality. And also our leaders, you know, our current leaders who are actually the first beneficiaries of that status quo in terms of the mindset, right? Because if you know, as long as we stay in victimhood, we don't try to fight more. Uh, we stay poor and the foreign aid keeps on pouring in to fix supposedly that, right. poverty, that poverty. And so that whole side of the argument, he identified it as the hippo generation. Again, mindset. Instead of generation, think mindset. And then they were facing off with whom? The mm-hmm. cheetah generation. And um, definitely, you know, J- um, George said, you know, he's like, you're definitely one of my uh, early children. Everybody on that stage, for all of us there, all these African cohort, he said, you guys are my cheetahs, you know? And so we were so proud. I was yeah. just like, yeah. It's very flattering, then, right? That you don't, I mean, if is. you're, a ch- you're e- either a cheetah or a hippo, it's like, I'm going with cheetah. Yeah. I love that. No, it was so cool. You had no idea. And, that, and you know, uh, Nick, what George did for me and the, all 99 mm-hmm. other, you know, fellows, it's, it's, I think George just, ah, oh, I felt for me at least, he just, carried on the work that my grandma did with me in my early days. But anyway, I go back. So George was there and he said, facing off with the cheetah generation, he said the cheetah generation is a generation of Africans with a mindset that really are waiting for no one. They're not going to wait for the government. They're not going to wait for the foreign aid. They're not going to wait for, they're going to wait for no one. They, they believe in themselves. They know they have the tools and they're going to just, they're just going to get it done. And he said, the future of our continent lies on the back of the cheetahs and he his whole thing was runs run cheetahs run have the best run of your life and for me i interpret that as as well just like the cheetah runs in leaps and bounds yeah. uh the time to catching up for africa is over the type of leapfrogging is upon us and so even there the 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 the, 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 the metaphor goes very well so the cheetahs because speed Agile, being agile, but also before a cheetah goes for the when she does a hunting, eighty percent of her time is spent on strategizing. You'll see them kind of sitting, uh, laying around, you know, looking like they're just, you know, taking some a break or whatever. And then uh, if you don't pay attention, you don't know what's going on. You think it's all cool. But if you start to pay attention, you'll see that there is maybe an antelope or a gazelle not too far away. But when the cheetahs start to run, the way you see them spreading, first of all, and then going one corner, you this one corner, that one corner, and then one among them is in charge of the race. Yeah. And as you know, they go from zero to 60 or 65 in three, I mean, something wild. And so they just go for it. And it's just, it's just beautiful. So it's about strategizing. It's about preparing before you go for the fight. And when you go, you have to be precise. You have to you have to go for speed and just get it done. So that's what the cheetah generation is. And um, it's a mindset. It's not about your age. It's not about uh, are you African or, non- or non-African. It's not about are you an African living on the continent or in the diaspora. Mm-hmm. It's very much do you believe that we have a bright future? And do you believe that the bright future will be achieved by the free markets? And, and you know, you talk about that TED conference in particular because Aita was there as well as uh, Andrew Mwenda, who you mentioned. But yeah. Bono, uh, I mean, what was fascinating about that, that was the beginning of a shift in his mindset. He had been, uh, you know, people, I think he himself would agree that he has something of a Christ complex, of a savior complex. And he had been, you know, to his credit, he had been trying to talk up, how do we help the developing world? How do we help Africa? And he yes. came out of that, uh, you know, essentially within a couple of years saying that trade is better than aid. So yeah. the Aite, the Mwenda message, the one that you are selling now yeah. has had real yes. impact on, you know, yes. on at least some people involved in this space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. So, yes, because what happened there, Bono, when he was hearing people like Mwenda, when he was hearing people like, um, you know, Aite and many others kind of pushing back on the aid rhetoric, I think for him, it was the very first time that people like him uh, were, so were actually hearing the other side of a story from Africans. Yeah. Because up till then, they spent most of their time with, um, you know, benefactors of the status quo in terms of uh, the uh, consensus around why Africa was poor. Right. And then it all landed them on foreign aid. And so our leaders back home were benefiting from that, you know, p- basically lining their pockets 
And the donor aid community was benefiting from that, especially government to government aid, because it's a it's a way of being able to practice, um, you know, neocolonialism right. in, a very, in a soft way, but still. So what's not to love for the different governments that benefit from that, um, you know, uh, scenario. Right. But this was, and I think Bono has always been involved with people who actually benefit from that, whether it's the IMF, the, um, the World Bank. I mean, that whole structure of what some of us would call Poverty Inc., you right. know, it, that rhetoric really benefits them. Uh, so I think Bono has been specifically more speaking to them and maybe some of their direct recipients who, which person who is getting access to clean water is going to tell you, oh, the aid didn't help me or whatever. But I, but I think what he has never been able to hear until then was people like uh, George Ayite, you know, mm-hmm. very, very much have their act together, very much, you know, know what they're talking about and yet had a very different viewpoint. And I think it was a shock. I think the fact that he went to heckle Mwenda is... Mm. It was because that's what he did. He heckled a speaker, yeah. an African on stage in his continent, on his continent, saying aid is no good for us. Right. And Bono, I think, which I think it was just one of those electroshocks that one gets. And his first knee jerk reaction, it, it was just a knee jerk reaction. You know, the mm-hmm. nerves were just reacting. And I think that's what happened. But eventually... As he went on, and that's what I say to people, I feel like Bono, I, I'm not surprised Bono came to our side on, when, no. on these issues. Because he, I think, I know Bono always cared. He may yeah. not have gone about it the right way, but he always cared. And the fact that he truly cared, and this, by the way, Nick, is the crux of the book as well. If you truly care, you cannot be blind to the evidence. Right. And it, it and sounded he, like in that in that ex, one of the exchanges that you recount in the book at, at that uh, moment, in Africa, uh, Mwenda had asked the crowd, you know, can you show me a country that's gotten a lot of aid that has done well? And Bono was like, yeah, Ireland. Um, and it's yes. fascinating because Ireland has long been one of the poorest countries on the planet, certainly in, in Europe. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And Mwenda uh, rebutted that by saying, no, you were given opportunity. Like when the Celtic tiger took off, it was because they essentially opened themselves up through a series of business reforms, tax regulation to engaging and integrating into world markets rather than just getting money uh, dropped from helicopters and things like that. Exactly. Um, Exactly. You know, I want to get to your uh, 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 the autobiographical parts of the book, which are fascinating and everything. But as long as we're talking about, uh, you know, kind of the question of foreign aid and African development, it's worth thinking about. Not long ago, I was talking to uh, Johan Norberg, a Swedish economist who you know, pointed out that in the early, like in the late 50s and early 60s, as decolonization was taking place around the world, most smart people were betting on Africa. Africa was doing better than Asia as a continent. Um, and Africa got a lot of aid. Asia got relatively little, but Asia has been doing better. So this goes to that question of, you know, trade versus aid. Um, but uh, you in the book and in your work, you've really kind of you know, the critique of the kind of aid mentality or the, you know, whether we want to call it a, a, you know, a great white savior or outsiders from Africa who are going to come in and fix everything. You have written a series of critiques and there's a blistering one in the book of Columbia University developmental economist Jeffrey Sachs. He was a major force in creating and pushing the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, uh, which were kind of like for the 21st century, this was the, the the new way that the, you know, the wealthy part of the world or the global North was going to help the global South. Um, what does, what do people like Jeffrey Sachs fundamentally get wrong? What is, what is wrong with the framework that they are trying to impart on the developing world? Well, I think that, um, the part that Je- someone like Jeffrey Sachs doesn't understand, although he, you know, yeah, you can call yourself an economist. Um, we all know our issues with Stiglitz and people like that. But to me, it's just not understanding at the end of the day the way the world works and not understanding economics. I'm sorry, you know, um, and uh, and also in the end, it's not really rocket science. And maybe that's why <laughs> for people who are always looking for complexity, um, they fail to see that. I, I think for folks like him, it's very something very unsettling about this idea that um, you know the market can can take care of things, right? And so um, the reason why I say he doesn't understand economics, he doesn't understand how things work, is I'll just give you examples because the thing is, people like Jeffrey Sachs and his team, 
came to me. Um, and for uh, what was the book? Anina Mungsa, she has a book, an amazing book that I would recommend everybody to read. I meant, I think I mentioned it in the yes, she uh, did. and I've forgotten the, the name of it. Uh, I think it's it. Yeah, I think it's ideal, something like that. So anyway, so for people listening to us and uh, the story with Jeffrey Sachs, um, Jeffrey Sachs, you know, celebrity economist back then um, has said, I mean, he thought he could fix poverty and so forth. But then what he did is basically set up a village, what they would call the Millennium Development, Go- uh, De- De- Millennium Development Villages. And there they just went on to basically do a very top down type of um, approach to economics. And so if only... People grew this type of crops and did it in this way and all of that, then things are going to work. Except that none of them ever thought about, oh, we're going to have to sell this thing to somebody, don't we? And so they went for the whole capacity building part. And this is, by the way, a lot of what aid does, a lot of what the World Bank is financing, a a lot of what the IMF is financing, because frankly, that's all they can finance. Mm -hmm. Financing buildings, maybe, or even training, that's fine. You can finance that. But the activity that comes around, you don't just wake up and say, uh, you're going to have to focus on bananas. You're going to have to focus on coffee. That's not how it works. So in their case, they got all of that capacity building going. And then they started looking around and being like, okay, uh, we have now these nice, you know, warehouses for the hibiscus that the women were growing or the bananas. We have um, all, everything is in bags. Everything's great. And then they're like, well, how exactly are we going to sell this? And that's when they reach out to someone like me, uh, him and his lieutenants. And then basically they were expecting for me to just hand out decades of my work, relationship buildings, um, going to buyers, finding out who is buying what, uh, finding out what customers want, finding out all of this stuff and uh, creating a product that matches the, the market and all of that. So they came to me and said, basically hand out all of those relationships. Mm-hmm. Hand out all of that know-how and that all of that knowledge because, you know, we're trying to save Africa. Literally, mm-hmm. that's what we're saying. And I'm like, even then you have no respect for how the market works. Because if you were talking mm-hmm. to another person that you would like to consult with, I know you would probably be proposed to pay them. I know you would not just expect them to just hand over their relationship, their buyer relationships mm-hmm. without maybe proposing uh, some type of contract, maybe 5% of what gets sold or not. Mm-hmm. No, the attitude they even had with me, I'm like, if this is an attitude you have on the market, no, no wonder you go nowhere. Mm-hmm. So eventually what happened is they went nowhere and things started ratting all over the place. All of this stuff that we spent, they spent millions of dollars on. And by the way, yeah. an entrepreneur would have probably produced the same, better quality, cheaper and still be able to sell it but they were had nothing to show for and um so that's the mentality of people like that but then it doesn't stop there because what happens is by the time i showed up and i was trying to do i was working on setting up the supply chain at some point we look like we could look like we're like them because uh, the first part of the supply chain is you grow the hibiscus you store it all of that mm-hmm. but by the time i arrived a lot of these women were like there's no way we're going to be growing hibiscus again we know your type. You come from over there. You tell us it's just a matter of producing uh, X, Y, Z. And then we work hard. We spend all of our time doing it. And in the end, we have nothing to show for. Look over there. We still have production from last year that's rotting in these, in these warehouses mm-hmm. that they supposedly built for us. So we don't have time for this lady. Bye. So I even had to redo, undo that story and redo it to get them to yeah. even be willing to producing. So you see, it doesn't stop at what he did. Yeah. Um, You talk a lot in the book. I mean, if there is a message, it's that what Africa, you know, what Africa would benefit from is, you know, millions of Africans creating businesses, uh, becoming entrepreneurial and things like that. But you, you stress how hard it is within Africa to start a business. Um, Can you work a little bit through at, at one point you talk about you know, how, what it's like to start a business in Senegal, your home country, uh, versus, you know, opening a business in, say, Houston, Texas, or something like that. No, we'll go into that. But uh, but before I go that, um, before I go there, Nick, allow me to go back just a little bit to the foreign aid, because mm-hmm. that one, I think it's very important that I try to nail it here with you, because uh, despite saying what, what, we say many people still have a hard time because like, how come you an African be against foreign aid? How, how, how? And even, beyond, you know, then I say, you have to think the world is life is made of trade-offs, Nick, you know that very well. But when it comes to foreign aid, I think people only look at supposedly the little wins, uh, you know, in, in the trade-offs. But 
I want to make it clear here for people to understand the, the trade-offs because they're very important. So I had this woman, she was very upset with me. And so that's the reason why I, I had to go there. So for her, it's like, surely the roads can be can only be helpful, aren't they? You know, you're not going to tell me that you're for dirt roads and people mm -hmm. not having ways to go from point A to point B. And I said, listen, lady, I don't. But still, with even with that in mind, this is why I have a beef with foreign aid. I said, for that road, for that road, you're seeing a road. And that's the reason why for you, we need to continue. Okay. Let us let let me tell you what that road is really the cost really of that road. You see road equals benefit. Let me talk mm -hmm. about the cost. Cost number one. Because of this road, I have a culture of dependency that gets that keeps on being ingrained in my people. That surely cannot be good for the entrepreneurial mindset that I would like to but but we need from them in order to really uh, create wealth and value. Right, a cultural dependency just doesn't go hand in hand. How, well how does with... a road create dependence? Okay, I'll tell you how it does. Because if we have to rely, we we got this road. This road came because of foreign aid. Foreign aid came to us because supposedly we're poor. Our governments are literally poor. Hmm. They don't have enough money to cater to all the needs of what the government would need money for: building roads, building schools, building hospitals. Things like that, that's what people think about most of the time, building infrastructure, especially. Now, I would like to tell them people, why do you think we are in that situation? Why do you think that we're poor in the first place so much that we need you uh, to you know, inject the additional cash so that we can build the roads that normally we should have built for ourselves with the money that we made? We are poor because we don't let our entrepreneurs work. Mm -hmm. So... If you just come and finance for me what I should have financed for myself and by myself, you and you and we keep doing this, nothing has changed since the end of so-called colonialism. You know, um, nothing has changed. So for the past 60 some plus years, our people seeing this happen regularly, it means that, uh, you know, you're building a culture of dependency because for 60 years, we don't expect to be building our own roads. And that's something that I explain, um, I see oftentimes, you know, like just the other day, I give you an example. I am uh, about to, I just actually hired him. At first I was almost like gonna back off, but then I remembered my, okay, my God, you're trying to build the teacher generation, stay calm. So we were discussing, you know, we were negotiating um, a, a, a something, a, um, a contract for, to be part of my social media team. Right. So this young African all the way from Nigeria. And then um, I send him a message to to. So basically he proposes a price to me. The price makes absolutely no sense. You know, if you're in the marketplace, it makes no sense. It was way too high for what it was. He was definitely twice uh, twice as more expensive as what it should have been, at least, if not more. Then um, I say, OK, why not you go back? You think about it and you send me a message. And then he went back and he sent me a message. And his message was about. Well, um, and he, he gave me all the reasons why I should pay him that price, but none of it had really to do with the value he was bringing to the table. So it was very much about, I understand, I, you know, I, I appreciate I'm going to have the opportunity to apprentice with you and all of that stuff. He was, he could see all the goods he was going to get from this. And he also could see that he's not up to speed with where I need him to be, but we're integrating him and we're just going to keep him keep growing. But so none of this argumentary had to do with the value he was going to bring, but more this idea of, you know, my father has been taking care of, uh, of helping me, even though I'm a young adult now, he's 22 years old. I'm a young adult now. Um, and I just would like for him to finally have some relief and not have to support me. I'm an older, I'm the older one in the family. So it would be nice that I'm no longer a burden for him. And also if I'm uh, under good conditions and all of that, then it means that I could do a better work. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you and Nick coming and saying, I ideally would need the lifestyle of $100,000 a, a year, right? Whatever, what I'm just picking yeah. a number. Uh, and I know that I really should be getting only 5,000, but you know, if you pay me a hundred thousand, then, you know, it takes care of this problem, that problem, this problem, that problem, then maybe I can do a good job. And so when I saw that first, my, I was like, no, but then I got back to him and I said, you know, I really like XXX, but an entrepreneur serve, succeeds because they, everything is based on value. So while I have a lot of sympathy for all the things you share, this is not, the value yeah. doesn't match up with what you're going to bring. But you see, 
you would not see. I I talk to many people in the U.S. and in a, some parts of a developing world where you know people don't expect you know yeah. handouts so much, and they don't talk about things the same way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, but the fact that so many of us, this is how we justify want you know how we justify what we want to earn that's wrong and it goes back to that cultural dependency i was talking about yeah. we're perfectly happy saying i need this and give it to me and also when they deal with me thinking oh you, this wealthy person that you can just get whatever from so the dependency goes all the way down to me today trying to do a contract with this person mm-hmm. and having been there to say no we're not going to rely on people's goodwill so that's one number one okay. dependency number two so for that road I get a generation of young people mm-hmm. behaving this way, which cannot operate in the market. I go back. For that road, I also got um, more violence and uh, more violence as well as uh, leaders who never want to leave and usually through that, the violence. Mm-hmm. Let me explain myself. Foreign aid represents trillions of dollars that have been spent on this continent since the end of so-called uh, colonialism. So right. since the beginning of the independence, late 50s, early 60s, that's what's been going on. And look around you. You have people who have been around for more than 20 years, some of them almost 40 years. I think I think Togo is the guy who has the longest standing mm-hmm. out there. But anyway, so what happens here is what? Do you know what they're fighting for? Do you really think that they're fighting for the little peanuts that are that we are, you know, paying them in in, in the ways of taxes? Because mm-hmm. when you have so few and so few, um, you know, employees, official ones. So what they're fighting for really at the end of the day is control, control mm-hmm. for access to um, the natural resources. Mm-hmm. They contr- they're fighting for control to access to this foreign aid, mm-hmm. especially that foreign aid. They're fighting for that. So the more foreign aid you provide, the less these people have an incentive to actually let their wealth creators work. And most importantly, the more you're incentivizing them to not even want to leave. And that not wanting to leave will also lead to uh, violence. That, to me, that correlation is very direct and right. you would have to be blind to not see it. So for that road, I'm getting a president who's going to stay there forever despite mm-hmm. not doing jack. And I'm also going to get violence erupting because everybody's fighting each other in order to control that, that pile, of, pile, of, pile of money. So that's number two, that violence. And uh, um, last but not least, you are standing on us actually never getting there. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're pausing what we're going through right now. These, uh, there is no incentive in getting the business environment right so that our business, our wealth creators can create. Because yeah. if they can create, if our entrepreneurs are actually freed to enterprise, which is the environment that the only thing we ask from government is an enabling environment, mm-hmm. what's their incentives to put it in place? They put it in place, it means the poverty is gone, it means the foreign aid dries out. Mm-hmm. So I ask you, if for in exchange of a road, on top of that, it's going to be a crappy road, and if it's a bridge, maybe 10 years from now, the bridge is going to collapse, some of us are going to be dead on it, but who is going to go after the CCP-funded company that got the, mm-hmm. that got the contract? do in the first place. No, we're dead. Nobody cares. The road we paid for ended up costing us five times more than what it was supposed to cost because of all types of, you know, um, um, corruption, as we know. Mm -hmm. And so for that crappy road of yours, I get a cultural dependency that's going to follow my youth, Mm -hmm. um, you know, generation after generation. So we're talking long term. For that crappy road of yours, I'm going to get violence and also people who do not want to leave, even though they're not doing a good job. For that crappy wor- uh, road of yours, I'm going to get uh, an- another generation of entrepreneurs who are denied their right to enterprise, which will mm-hmm. lift the country out of poverty. So all of a sudden, does that road, does that foreign aid, uh, you know, is is it, does it all of a sudden right. look still so good? Yeah. That's- you, you know, you uh, talk about how uh, you're, you're obviously no fan of colonialism and imperialism, you know, as it existed in the 19th and the first half of the 20th century. But then you talk about a kind of neo-colonialism that is coming through foreign aid that empowers governments that are not in the business of, you know, of promoting their people, but rather in taking as much money as they can from the West and things like that. 
one of the things that you point out, and there's a really deep and, and horrible irony here, is that one of the most successful exports to Africa from the West is essentially socialism or a kind of top-down structure where the government is, you know, pick not it's beyond picking winners and losers. It's really controlling access to all sorts of things. Can you talk about the persistence of, if not pure socialism, then a kind of socialist mentality where a few people kind of call all the shots? Um, you know, yes. where does that come from and how do you confront that in 21st century Africa? Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> when I started to connect the dots, as I'm trying to, as I explained in the book, as to how prosperity actually is built, because you know, also another thing is, I think many people forget that uh, poverty is the natural state of man, man as mm -hmm. in humanity. But in any case, um, when you ask yourself, how is prosperity built and eventually you start to connect the dots, me in my case, being an entrepreneur, doing business on both sides of the world is really what opened my eyes to this whole issue around, um, around the really rotten business environments that many African nations offer their citizens and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, so there, when I discovered that, I was I was blown away. I was just really blown away when when I when I made the the, 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 the connected the dots between the fact that wait, if you make it hard for your entrepreneurs to enterprise, of course they're not going to build the wealth and the prosperity right. that goes with it, and of course they're not going to have a sovereignty that goes with being a prosperous nation. Conversely, if you make it easy for your entrepreneurs to enterprise, they build wealth, you know, prosperity, and then people, your country is is. Prosperous, meaning it matters in the grand scheme of thing in this board called the world. And when I understood that, I was like, wait, so then why why do we have such rotten environments? I mean, did we just wake up and it was this way? What happened to us? Uh, have we just, are we just as crazy as some people claim we are or as stupid as some people claim we are that we would not, you know, know what it, what it takes and do it? And then that's when I started to stumble upon the work of someone like Georgia Yite. Mm -hmm. Because George Ayite had the missing piece for me. And Nick, when I started reading from George, that's when I made a realization even myself. I realized back then that as an African who, who profoundly cared about Africa, even I, for me, mm -hmm. the story of Africa started with slavery. Mm -hmm. From there, moved on to colonialism and then to present day. Mm -hmm. But it never occurred to me uh, to even, first of all, think about Africa pre-slavery time. Mm -hmm. Let alone think about what type of um, you know economic systems were being ran in different parts of the continent. All of that. It's when I read from George that I was I'm like, wait, wait, wait. These people have been around for a long time before that time. But the world, the rest of the world, seems to have established as the starting point for African history. And I realized to this day, many people, black, non-black, African, mm -hmm. non-African, for many people unconsciously, the story of Africa. And black people start with slavery. Mm -hmm. And George, George was amazing in the sense that um, he looked in a different direction. And so not only he looked there, he was curious about that, but then what he had uncovered and what the research is uncovering more and more, he said, man, before the white man ever set foot on the continent, mm -hmm. very free, free, free enterprise, you mm -hmm. know, very, uh, people were free. And then people are like, oh, what are you talking about tribes? And, no, 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 go back and research mm -hmm. all of this. And then even research the work of people like um, Jomo you know, Kenyatta, the mm -hmm. first uh, leader of uh, Kenya. So what all of this is showing you is even there, when people thought that Africans don't uh, have the same um, you know, relationship to private property, to property mm -hmm. rights, Kenyatta is showing in his books why that was just like a, a, a makeup of a, West, of a Western person mm -hmm. who doesn't understand what really goes on. Because he would tell you in his book, Facing Mount Kenya, Every single piece of land, you ask the African, you say, whose land is it? They'll say ours. But what they mean by ours is what you think. Because, and he says, every single plot of land could be traced directly to the person it belongs to, the family it belongs to, or the clan it belongs to. Every time we're talking about private ownership of the land. And, and you see, and, but something like that was misconstrued, and it was the ways for Western today. Aha, uh -huh. we told you Africans are socialists and the Africans right. led more on that with their Ubuntu concept. I am because we are. And so that's what someone like Nyerere of Tanzania, for example, leaned on to say, yes, this is, we are socialists as well. And mm -hmm. the African social 
is Ubuntu. So we conflated things that had nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. The way Africans live as a social fabric, we're very, yeah, we're social, it's in our social fabric. Mm -hmm. But in terms how we used to make our money, we were as capitalist as anybody else. Right. And but by even, capitalist, you're just, I mean, you're essentially just talking about kind of voluntary market. market transactions. Yeah, yeah, free market. Exactly. Free market yeah. entrepreneurism. So so what happened there is, so now you go back, because I, my question was, why, why are we doing this today? What happened to us? And then what happened is what George put his finger on that critical, pivotal moment in our life, in our history as Africans, as to why we are to where we are today, economically speaking. So basically what happened was during the end of the 50s, early 60s, uh, you know, with um, um, Nick, you we were at the height of the ideological battle as right. represented on one end by the, by the West, fighting for freedom and practicing capitalism as its economic system, the free market, and then facing off with the East, various forms of statism. Mm -hmm. It is during that time, we were just, um, are some, some of the people who would be the liberators of Africa, meaning the, the people who would go on to also be the first presidents of these mm -hmm. nations. They, um, they, during that um, battle of ideologies that was going on, both sides looking for influence, usually looking mm -hmm. south to the global south, <clears throat> we, you can very easily understand what happened, and it is what happened. Basically, um, the Marxist socialist of the time, but first of all, it was the fury en vogue. You would have to have been crazy to believe that Marxist socialism did not work mm -hmm. because we were still in the middle of the lies coming from the you know, Soviet Union about mm -hmm. you know um, their crap still working. Mm -hmm. So um, our side said, our Africans basically, um, they said, look, the West is who enslaved us, mm -hmm. then colonialism, um, surely whatever they're promoting, we're going to be against. And on top of that, you Marxist, are the ones who traditionally have been fighting for racial justice, which mm -hmm. is very true, which is very true. You know, for all my criticism of these guys, minus Marx himself, who was a racist, mm -hmm. but Marxist, there are many, there were many well-meaning Marxist people who actually believed in racial justice. Mm -hmm. And so between those two combinations and the forces of the time, and just where most intellectuals were back in the, back in the times, yeah. many of these people uh, embraced the um, the Marxist socialism ideologies of their time, and that's how Africa, as most of the continent, was going to become mm -hmm. free, and starting their independences, it started with basically leaders who have been infected with the disease that Marxist socialism ideology is, yeah. and that's how Nick, we got to where we are today. Because by the way, that heritage has never been questioned again mm -hmm. ever. And what the book is trying to do is for us to question that legacy. Yeah. That needs to be questioned. We need to question the legacy of Thomas Sankara. We need to, to, uh, to um, look at the legacy of people like Julius Nyerere. Mm. All of them, we have to look at the legacy and be able to say, yes, I completely understand where you came from. I completely understand where you came from. I can even understand the, 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 the emotional state in which mm. you were. And I can even forgive you for having gone that path. But 60 some plus years later, with everything that we know, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and everything that the world has given us, the latest in, in them being China, being able to rise to prosperity thanks to the free markets through right. the SEZs, we have no more excuse for not, you know, challenging the legacy of, um, of that time. Let's talk about the present reality. I mean, one of the most, you know, stunning parts of the book is when you you discuss the the difficulties of starting a business in your home country. Can you explain to people, you know, it's like it, it's never easy to start a business in the first place because you have no idea if it's going to work. You got to get, you know, capital or partners and things like that. But what makes it so hard? What are the steps that make it really tough in Senegal to, you know, yeah. start working? Yeah. So basically, um, like you said, yeah, hard start running, starting and running a business anywhere is hard enough. That's just the nature of business. It's hard. That's why there is only a few part of the population that are business business entrepreneurs. But there is a reason why most of us are just happy doing our own thing, having a job, and you know we don't want to have to think about how to make payroll. Um, so not so we have those added. We have those normal difficulties of doing business because I'm not I'm not crying about it. 
it's it's my choice. We all know it's hard. It's yet my choice. So I'm not going to cry for that. And I actually welcome the challenges. But it makes life more fun. <clears throat> but the problem you have in Africa, in many African nations, is that uh, you have these added um, non-necessary hurdles that are completely man-made. I would say I should say this in this way, government made. So let me try to explain to people what this means, because when I have sometimes arguments with uh, friends of mine who are fellow Bernie Sanders, you know, supporters, and they're like, ah, you know, like, uh, um, what do you call it? The Scandinavian nations are a model. And I said to them, then, okay, great. Then do you believe that it should be as easy for any entrepreneur in Scandinavia to do business as it is for any entrepreneur in Africa? Do you believe it should be? Yes, I do. Okay, so then we've got a problem because Scandinavia is more capitalist than most African nations, okay? Right. So then it's like, wait, what? What do you mean? Okay, this is what I mean. What I mean is, Nick, we're in the U.S. Uh, and I told you, I have a sister company here and a sister company in Senegal. That's all, we, all my businesses have that in common. So I'm very much front seat to look at the discrepancy between the ease of doing business on both sides. And then to realize the one in Senegal is not just uh, an anecdote. It's not just Senegal that's like that. It's pretty much the whole continent. And this is why, by the way, you always hear me saying Africa. And then my friends are like, quit saying Africa, Africa is 54 countries. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, you know better than I do. But anyway, keep on scrolling. At the end of the day, we, whoever, even though we're 54 nations, when it comes to our business environment, we very much start to look like a village. So yes, I'm going to keep saying Africa. Okay. So when it comes to, um, to that, what does it mean? Uh, the business in the U.S., Nick and Magat need to get into an employment contract. Nick is going to be a great lab technician, and it's all great. We negotiate the price. That works for you. That works for me. You know, then we go to, we, we go to work. We, I send you a, a contract. You sign it. I sign it. Put it in my, in my, uh, I put it in my drawer. You put it in your drawer, in your, in your cloud, whatever. We, now we move on to work. Every year. Uh, Every two weeks, I can, you know, your your pay comes directly mm -hmm. into your bank account. We have set up everything. Now, and all of this, by the way, happens quickly, yeah. right? I when you send me the contract, send me your bank information. Everything is good to go. Now we're in Senegal. Nick and Magat want to get into the same contract. Well, <clears throat> we're gonna have to print it, print it, physical copies in three. You sign, I sign, all of them. Then. I or my CPA, and I better hire a CPA because if you try to do it by yourself, you're going to make mistakes because the labor laws are so complicated that you should hire an expert in order to not make a mistake. Because if you make a mistake, it means you might be harassed. Your employee might come after you for various things as well as the state. So you don't want to make mistakes on that. So you have to hire somebody, which means extra cost. So I hire my CPA. CPA is in the capital city because that's usually where a lot of the good people are because everybody's concentrated in the capital city because all the government offices are concentrated there as well. That's how you have one capital city where you have one quarter of a population living in and living like sardines and right. all the, all the you know. Anyway, so <clears throat> three, three, one. So I have now, next. my next step is I'm going to have to go physically. You'll be like, 2023, why do you have to go? Because our government, our government officials do not look at emails. If you're going to email them something, you might as well imagine it was lost in no. the mail. Real. So you get yourself in a car. In our case, we are in the middle of nowhere. We're in a little village. And I did that on purpose because my whole thing is I'm not going to do like everybody else and go into crowded capital city where 25% of the population is. We need to give people a chance to stay in their communities mm -hmm. and build, you know, a life. But the way that's going to happen, you have to anchor it with two things. But the first thing is a job. And then we also anchor it with a second thing, a school, because we have a school for the children of our workers. So, but I did this. It was my goal. My goal was I want to do it reverse so people get a chance to stay home in their communities and build and not do what my parents did, but at the national level. My parents left me behind to migrate to uh, abroad. In this case, many parents leave their kids behind to migrate to a, to a big city. Mm -hmm. So as a little girl, you still have the same problem. Where's mom? Where's daddy? That's not, that's not fun. Mm -hmm. So I, and my, so, and I think Nick, that story has been what's followed me my whole life. My whole life, I did not want for other kids to have to be separated from their mm -hmm. parents or their grandma, because later I had to leave my grandma uh, just because of economic reasons. No child should have to go through that if we can, if us the adults can afford it, can, uh, can avoid it. And so I really did what I believed in. And so mm -hmm. I went to these uh, communities and built there. And so what it means is, okay, but the problem is I have to go, uh, once we sign these documents, 
we have to go to what we call inspection du travail. So labor inspection office, it's a government office. Um, we're lucky because we don't have to go to the capital city in this case, which is a good two, three hours away. Um, in this case, it looks like there is a regional antenna, but still an hour away. An hour, hour and a half, depending on how bad the roads are that day. And it's usually between an hour, hour and a half. So I have to drive there. So we leave first thing in the morning to be there. We arrive. So basically what it is, is once you arrive there, some government official who does not even know where you, where you guys are operating from, he does, he has never built a business in his life, in his life. He knows nothing about our industry. He knows nothing, nothing, nothing about anything. But this person, Nick, will get to decide if you and I indeed can work together. Hmm. After we have said we want to work together and we sign the documents. So, and so this person show up at the office. Uh, you're there for eight o'clock, even before eight, because it opens at eight. So you're there before, so you're going to be the first one and go back because you've got, you've got a business to run. Nine, nobody. Ten, no one. Eleven, no one. Noon, where is he? Running errands, personal errands. And there's absolutely nothing that I can do about it, even though the guy is there to serve me. Remember, right. government official. And everybody shuts up because if you start to show that you're upset or even frustrated, mm -hmm. oh, guess what? It's going to take you longer because they know how to make you pay for your, you know, your, your attitude, because that's how they call it. So the guy shows up, and in this case, he said, well, where is um, Nick's health certificate? Hmm. I'm like, wait, what? And here, I had hired a CPA to handle all of this. He's the one who handled the contracts, everything, and told me every single step that I need to go through so it's done right. And I arrive, and this guy tells me about a piece of paper that's in the law, but, I've, hmm. but my, my CPA didn't send me. And I call the CPA, and I'm like, He's saying I need a, an extra document. And, I'm, and he's like, what are you talking about? And so we, he talks to him and the guy said, well, it's in there that we have to have a health certificate to make sure that uh, Nick is physically up to do this job. <laughs> and so we didn't know about that. So now he's like, well, uh, but you know, that's what they like. <laughs> that, you, that there's a law and there's so many of them. Of course, there are some you're not going to know. <laughs> and then you don't know about it. And now I could see in his eyes, his eyes were sparkling because you know what? He was now waiting for a bribe. Mm -hmm. because think about it. I'm this entrepreneur. I've got so much to do. I left my company early in the morning, cut on my sleep, cut, got in early in the morning, waited until noon. Finally, he's there, but he's telling me that my file is missing something. And it means I'm going to have to start over all over again. Well, yeah. guess what? Most people do exactly what's, what's, what, the, what is coming next. You give a little something and then all of a sudden, oh, okay, fine. Yeah. I don't need the, fine, you can go. So in my case, I said, I am not going to do that because I don't give bribes. Because especially if I stand where I send a plus for me, it's good because I get to see all the problems. Yeah. So I go back, I go back, I send you to the doctor who doesn't even look at you. This is a rent seeking thing as well. It's in mm -hmm. the laws, everybody, baby. And so he writes you the thing, never looked at you, they didn't measure nothing. Mm -hmm. Then you come back with a paper, I go back. Now he's allowing me for 60% of the files that I brought to, be, uh, to go through. But then there's a few that don't go through because he said... Uh, this guy, he's going to have to be a, la a, night, a night guard in your, in your company. And uh, sorry, but the convention says nothing of that for that type of company, mm -hmm. that type of industry. I'm like, wait, what? So because the thing is, in Senegal, every single job is uh, in a convention, is part of mm -hmm. a, a corps, you know, a yeah. Peace Corp or whatever, corp, with the government. This is very civil law style. Right. And this is also why the law versus common law. So in this case, that's, that's what it is. And so, Nick, after months of going back and forth, I was able to finally hire some of these employees if I wanted to do it the legal way. Right. And so just this level, that's what it is. Then the people I hired, how do I pay them? Normally it should be a bank account. But guess what? Uh, an overwhelming majority of people are unbanked. Why are they unbanked? Because some of my employees you know, they don't even have um, IDs, proper IDs. And if you don't have a proper ID, you can imagine you can't even open a bank account. Uh -huh. And even if you open a bank account, when you have certain salaries, if your salary is just, you know, good enough for you to take care of your family and everything, and the bank wants to function a good amount from it every single month, that mm -hmm. makes no sense. So I am working with my employees to find out, first of all, how can we have you be able to receive money in a different form than just cash? Because also I can't just give them cash because otherwise I can't get my accounting records straight, which means they're going to come after me and say, what are you, uh, you know, what type of money laundering are you doing or who knows what else? So I have to show things that are official. 
they are not official. You can't really, you know, you shouldn't really try to get to force them into having this bank account. But even if they have, it's going to cost them a lot because the banking systems are among the most regulated in Africa, which means also among the most costly. Mm -hmm. So we eventually there, we had to rely on crypto in order just to have a money move. Because sometimes you would try. So at first, how I was paying people, some, one person who has nothing to do with our company has a bank account. I would wire money from the U.S. to that person. And then that person uh, disperses it by making everybody sign. So we have a record that the yeah. money went from to Z to Z. F one day, this person, I'm trying to send him money. And after two weeks, wire. After two weeks, we don't know where the money is. And eventually, after four weeks, the money gets returned. Hmm. Like that. Gets returned. And then I tried to do it through Western Union. After a few, um, you know, for a few times, it worked. But all of a sudden, I get a call from the compliance office from Western Union after the money left to say there is a problem, uh, we need to know who you're sending this money to, you know, the whole KYC yeah. thing, know your customer mm -hmm. stuff. Right. And so um, the, so I had to answer, who are these people? How do I know them? How long have I known them? What am I doing with them? Do I have proof of what we're doing? All of this stuff. And then um, finally, um, they're like, okay, after being literally feeling like what's like an interrogation, mm -hmm. uh, like you're some type of criminal, finally they say, okay, we'll call you back. Only two hours later to say, well, you did not, we, we were not satisfied with what you said. So your money will be returned. Uh, you'll get it back in eight days. Oh, thanks a lot. My money now yeah. is with you. You're going to give it for eight days and then send it back to me. Meanwhile, I have to think about what else to do. That's what, in a way, me got me into crypto. Right. So when people talk about crypto and saying, oh, it's a scam scheme. No, you because in the West, you look at crypto as an asset class to uh, and a speculative you know, uh, asset class. Us, it's more simple than that. Crypto for us, especially Bitcoin, simply represents basically the function of currency, right. um, you know, that we need. so we see that in crypto. So anyway, so so this is all the things, Nick. Right. That and I have then, to well, do. can I layer another thing that you talk about in the book? Is then in places like Senegal, when you are importing goods that you might need, yes. you know, if you if you need a computer, if you need a car, if you need whatever, yep. the tariffs are tremendous, right? As well as Absolutely. when you're sending goods out of the country. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, for example, you need a car to come in. Um, you know, cars are basically the car is going to cost you double by the time you're done with tariffs, mm -hmm. literally. And um, then you have then you're going to have this company, you know, the, 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 their uh, investment office, Apix, in this case, l'Agence uh, de la Promotion des Investissements Étrangers. Mm -hmm. So Apix, they literally they stand for helping, you know, like assisting in uh, F with FDI, like making it easy for you to supposedly set up a shop. Mm -hmm. But all it is really is on the equipment that you're going to need for your business. They're going to withhold uh, the taxes that you should have paid, the tariffs that you should have paid on it for at least three years because, uh, yeah, it takes at least three years to the company to get up. But it's not like they're excusing you that. They're just withholding it. So once you get there, you're going to have to pay this thing. So exactly how did you help me? It's still going to still going to be the same cost of doing business. You just delayed it. And so is, that's number one. So, is is that kind of set up uh, similar throughout Africa, regardless of what countries might have, uh, you know, what European countries might have uh, been the colonial powers? Yeah, it is. It is. <clears throat> because Nick, think about it. What all of these countries have in common, because if you if you never bothered to think about liberating your wealth creators, aka entrepreneurs, if you never bothered to liberate them and you stayed in this madness that you inherited from the colonial times, right, of uh, socialist policies, most African nations are run with uh, five, even for the ones that are not, that say, oh, no, we're not socialist or we, we like Nigeria, for example, even them are running five-year plan a la Soviet style, right? So for the most part, we're still in the same camp. Um, so if you don't make it easy or possible for your wealth creators to create and create en masse, mm -hmm. then what happens? You stay poor. And so what you're going to have to rely on, your only source of uh, budget income as a nation is going to be the money you get from foreign aid mm -hmm. to supplement the little that you get from whatever you get from taxing your people. So basically, your whole game is domestically you tax your people to death on everything that you can put your hands on. And given that you don't produce much on the ground, um, you know, you're primarily relying on uh, natural resource mm -hmm. extraction, yet these are people who live there, people who are going to need shampoos, people who are going to need soap, people who are going to need um, cars, people who are going to need uh, TVs, refrigerators mm -hmm. when they can afford it. They're going to need all of that. And you don't produce any of this crap because you didn't allow for the market forces to get you there. 
Mm-hmm. So you you basically you're waiting them. You're waiting them exactly where you know they're going to show up at. They're mm-hmm. going to show up at uh, the the t- customs office because the stuff is going to have to come from outside. And so basically, your your strategy for filling up the uh, the government's coffers is going to be domestically tariff, 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 mm-hmm. tariff, and also taxes, 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 and uh, internationally it's going to be foreign aid. That's basically your re- your revenue plan. Um, and are it follows. You- are you a fan then of uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the UN helped push through the African continental free trade area, which sought to minimize tariffs among uh, different African countries as well as coming in. Is that conceptually a step in the right direction or is that more kind of interference? Yeah. So if they really follow through, it can only be a good thing. I am a big fan, always, everywhere, all the time, of free movements of people, goods, services, Mm -hmm. and ideas, especially ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. And insofar as the AFCTA, you know, supposedly that's the goal, then, of course, I rejoice. But that's where my, but then I'm cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, um, these things take forever. But most importantly, and most scaringly, I was in Ghana, um, not la- not this December, but last December, and I went to the offices, to the headquarters of the AFCTA mm-hmm. in Accra. And uh, I was allowed to sit on some meetings. I don't know why they allowed me, but I was able to sit on meetings where you had different uh, countries represented around the table. And actually, they were continuing some of their conversations. And Nick there, what did I discover? I discovered that pretty much, you know, like how sometimes you get, oh, buy one, get the second one free. Mm-hmm. But then you look at all the little lines and technically it's going to be almost near impossible to get the second one free. Well, that's what this AFCTA is mm-hmm. shaping out to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, every single country that's part of it for now is actually working on all the exemptions that they would like to put to it. Mm-hmm. And then um, basically, yes, but not this, not this part of the economy. Right. Yes, but not this. So this, by the time they're done, the increment we expect we, it was designed supposedly to provide is going to be almost null because everybody mm-hmm. is busy right now putting the little clauses to still keep it closed. Mm-hmm. And so I am not holding my breath. Yeah. I am simply not holding my breath. And, and the other thing about that too is they can open that all they want. But if you still don't understand the free markets, mm-hmm. if you still don't understand what an enabling business environment is, that's just the top of, um, that's just uh, icing, yeah. what they're proposing. The, 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 the ground base of this cake has not been caked yet. Yeah. And so, and I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say AFCTA worked. Let's say they had it and it's really working. Um, I can move my goods or my, and myself from one continent, well, one country to another within the mm-hmm. continent, but nothing else changed. Mm-hmm. The labor laws I talked to you about didn't mm-hmm. change. The, the permit, uh, obten- uh, how to obtain permits and how long and how much it cost did not change. The tax code did not change, become more simple to understand and easy to pay taxes did not change. Let's say none of those things, what we call economic freedom, but causes mm-hmm. is a big part of economic freedom, doesn't get changed. Then Magat is just saying, okay, okay, um, uh, you know, uh, Mauritania, fine, now when I buy... When I buy maybe my shea butter from you, I don't have to pay taxes on it. Uh, but I still have to pay taxes on a lot of things that most Africans don't manufacture today, which still need to go into my product. So, But the minute that product comes in anywhere from Africa, it's going to be taxed from that entry point, And then, you know, then from there, it starts right. to travel. So really, how much easier have you made it? have you made it for me? to do business. And is it going to be really still enough for me when I have a chance to build my business somewhere in Africa or outside of Africa to still choose Africa? Mm-hmm. That's the other thing. People think it's just you touch here, you touch here and things get better. That's why you should not try to control the market ever because it's not about touching one thing here, touching one thing there. Somehow the market, the way it works is enough. It's a, it's a, it's a critical mass of uh, things that have to happen for something mm-hmm. halfway across to make sense. And that, what it is, no one can really guess yeah. that. So leave people well, free to do so it. So how, let's talk a little bit about how you affect change, you know, within Africa or in other parts of the country, because uh, uh, other parts of the world. 
Um, you know, you mentioned Bitcoin as a way of routing around certain, you know, uh, uh, kind of bottlenecks in the economy and things like that. You uh, talk about startup cities. Um, yes. Yeah. How how would startup cities explain what those are and how that would help in an African context? Yes. So insofar as Africa is the most is the poorest region in the world region in the world because it happens to be the most overregulated region in the world. It's a region in the world where entrepreneurs lack what entrepreneurs need the most, which is an enabling business environment. Right. Now, most of these countries, you can imagine, there are people already benefiting from the status quo, mm-hmm. right? And you can therefore, and you also can appreciate, Nick, and I'm sure your audience, as much as the next person, how cumbersome and complicated and hard and long it takes to do piecemeal legislation and also reforms. We can all appreciate how complicated that is, costly, timely, everything. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there and thinking, while all of that is good in the absence of nothing else, we got to accelerate this. We got to accelerate. And most importantly, we have to be a little bit more radical because like we said, you and I, tweaking something here, tweaking something there is just not going to get us there. Mm -hmm. We have to, it's the, 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 the house in such a bad shape but we have to do, do tabula rasa and just mm-hmm. start over. But now, are you really going to be telling a whole country we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go from one day to another? Do that? Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna do that. So the idea instead is how about uh, we try to clean up um, clean up one st- one place at a time. So the, all the startup cities are is these are next generation. Uh, special economic zones with their own law, their own governance, especially when it comes to commercial law, right? And uh, usually based on commercial law, uh, on um, on a common law. Mm-hmm. So in any case, that's really for me what the solution is going to be, because what you're doing all of a sudden, you're, you're saying to these African entrepreneurs who are trapped into the dysfunctional you know, systems they're in right now, you're giving them a chance, you're basically giving them a chance to have straight from home, mm-hmm zones that are among the best business that have among the best business environments in the world mm-hmm. a la singapore a la denmark or better right and, and you you, you mentioned in- china took advantage of special economic zones you talk about this in the book where you know in the midst of a you know openly communist country they were like okay we're going to create a sandbox here where entrepreneurs or business interests are able to m- act much more freely than they would anywhere else in the country Exactly, exactly. So China did that, SEZ uh, by mm-hmm. SEZ. Me, I would call each of us SEZs a startup city. Right. And um, before China, places like Singapore have yeah. done it, but more at a nation state level because mm-hmm. they're small enough that um, right. they can do it for the whole country. Uh, but if you're big uh, as China is, you can do it zone by zone or startup city by startup city, and it still works. So mm-hmm. that's pretty much, um, you know, looking at that, um, but you know, I'm what is like, in it? To do what it. is in it? Say in Senegal, what would be in it for the government of Senegal to say, like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna let you have this zone of freedom, which is probably gonna very quickly kind of outperform the, the rest of the country, et cetera. Like, how do you, how do you get the the incumbents, yeah. the people who benefit from the status quo, to allow that kind of experimentation? Yeah. yeah. So first of all, um, it's a very good question. So I've been I've been on this path uh, for the past um, more than a year ago. I started more than a year ago being on this path of selling these ideas to African mm-hmm. governments. When I started, uh, we only had one African government that really seems to have understood and be on board. Everybody else was like, whatever, you know, they're doing their, their zones, like 80s style zone, you know, special economic zones. And everybody wondering why it's not working. But I'm like, hello, you're running an 80s software uh, when there is a when there is a premium when this this needs a premium software, but right. anyway, continue on. So what I think people need to understand on this, um, Nick, and why I am so bullish on the future of Africa is because we don't need all fifty four nations to go for this all at once. All I need is one nation to where you have a leader who is thinking a little bit more different than the others and also has different goals than the others, because not all of them are as corrupt as we think they are. And even if they do things that are corrupt, not all of them, given a chance, want to uh, stay in this state of uh, of misery and despair. And so here, what you do, uh, you need to find a leader like that, first of all. So when you're saying, how do you get somebody to what's in it for them? 
um, for a leader, what what is in it for them doing a startup city is is for a leader who deep down knows that I want to leave a, a, a better legacy behind, and I mm-hmm. I know that we need to create jobs, we need to do all of that. So you start with a leader like that. That's what's going to be in there for them. Then what you do is you make it easy for this leader. That's why startup cities matter. That's why we don't want to do it. You don't want to do it at the country level. Because that leader, even if he or she wants to see this, something like this thrive, uh, she or he is going to be limited because you, your many, many entrenched interests already exist. And you might be, a coup might happen on you or, I mean, depending on which circumstances it is, or um, all of your oligarchs or people who benefit from the current system uh, might become your enemies from one day to another. Make sure you don't get elected the next time or who knows your mm-hmm. party, who knows that. So there's all of these realities to deal with. And frankly, also, many people, the peoples the, of, of a country might not be on board, mm-hmm. not because they don't want to be more prosperous, but because, you know, people are concerned. What, what is that? How does that work? Uh, you mean now I have to do this? Um, you know, change. People don't like change. Even if it's sometimes, for, you know how everybody has, with back in the Facebook days, every time Facebook ch- changes something, yeah. we all hate it, right? So we're right. all done. But then we're like, we love it so much, like, yeah. please never. But left to our own devices, mm-hmm. we never would have voted for it. If we voted for it, we would have said no. So this reality is very true as well. So this is why the startup cities, what I like about it, it's a way for these leaders to actually get their bre- get their cake and eat it too. Yeah. So continue doing whatever it is that you're doing over here, but over here, let's do an experiment that doesn't affect anybody because it's a ra- it's an area that's rather unoccupied. So right. we're not exploiting people or anything like that. And in there, let's say, okay, what would happen if a commercial rules? Because that's the other thing here, right? I want to insist on that because I know there are many stories out there and things that really delay the adoption of this, which is like, oh, it's a country within a country. Hmm. No. It's just like if China is able to do something like this, you, you, it should give you everything you need to understand. Right. There is no sovereignty being being attacked. Uh, your 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 family laws remain the same. Your um, immigration law remain the same. Criminal law, all of that stuff remain the same. You're just saying when it comes to prosperity building, entrepreneurs need an enabling environment. So we're going to look at the commercial laws, especially, and make sure we give them the best uh, environment for them to create. That's really it. So, mm-hmm. so in an area like that, you are basically uh, making it an opt-in type of situation. And that's the other thing. You don't exclude the other people in the country mm-hmm. to come in. It's not about that. It's just like there is an extra option for anybody who wants to be able to run better businesses. Mm-hmm. And that's really all it is. And so what we have found is now we're talking to four countries, four. And I've, I'm very confident that very few, uh, in a very few months, we'll be able to announce um, the first one we, hmm. we picked because now they're competing a little bit with each other. Hmm. But um, so what's in it for someone, for a leader who really has their heart and their mind in the right place? Mm-hmm. Because not everybody is as bad as they look. Um, it's going to be legacy. It's going to be try before you buy because we're just trying over here. If it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, we tried. There's nothing more you can do. So that's what's in it for a leader like that. But if it works probably his whole country is going to ask no. to switch over. And then the change would have happened in a rather quick manner. It would have happened in a rather uh, undisruptive manner. Mm-hmm. And it would have happened in a way that the people actually are the ones at some point saying, yes, we want this to be everywhere. And when we get to that, then you see the change effect starting to happen mm-hmm. to other countries. Because other countries are not going to sit there. Other, other citizens c- certainly right. are not going to sit there and say, why are we not doing the same? And then that's it. That's it. Then, then, back, then I can die happy and go. Let's uh, talk about Skin is Skin. This is a company that you started a few years ago, and it, and it um, makes uh, skin and lip uh, balms or treatments. Um, how, what is Skin is Skin, is, and how does it exemplify what you're hoping to you know, kickstart all throughout African entrepreneurship and, uh, you know, and global enterprise? Yeah, so what Skinny Skin is, is basically, um, it's manufacturing, it's African products made in Africa by Africans. Uh, very much, you know, for the longest time, especially, um, you know, there is this movie, Poverty Inc., that was documented, that was very, very, very effective. I think it helped a lot of people understand the, the traverses of aid and even NGOs trying to help, but yet not helping as much as they, as, they fit, as they were thinking they were helping. So with Skinny Skin, really, at the end of the day, um, Nick, 
you're getting a great, uh, great skin treatments and uh, lip balms from mm -hmm. us. But me, pretty much, I'm in it for the jobs created. My mm -hmm. goal is 2.5 billion prosperous Africans by 2050. That's mm -hmm. my goal. And the way that's going to happen is as many jobs being created as possible, which means as many entrepreneurs mm -hmm. being allowed to enterprise as possible. And I, I offer myself as exhibit A or, you know, um, put your food where your mouth is. Um, don't just preach to people, but also practice what you preach. I'm a very big fan. I'm, a, I'm big on that. And on the concept of criticize by creating. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. And so what we're doing is we're pushing this whole concept of cheetah made. So so cheetah made, the best way to think about it is when, um, you know, Japan managed to have made in Japan, uh, mm -hmm. France made in France, um, made in Italy. When you hear that, it means a lot of things. It means yeah. superb craftsmanship, it means quality, it means premium. And, it, and so you're buying from these people, not because you feel sorry for them, but you're buying from yeah. these people because of what they bring to you. So in this case, this was... Um, Companies like um, like Skin is Skin and making it in Africa, mm -hmm. and the Cheetah made um, you know movement where where the Cheetah made a label we're pushing. Mm -hmm. All of that was my way of criticizing by creating towards um, initiative like Tom Shoes. Tom mm -hmm. Shoes believed that the way you help poor people is by giving giving them shoes because they could not afford to buy shoes, and then that whole thing of buy one give one model worked so well you mm -hmm. know you buy one and give one pair to a child in need because probably yeah. lives in poverty uh it works so well that everybody and their mothers about any company around started doing the same thing socks mm -hmm. so right. everything but people miss to understand is when you're shipping this uh your free stuff to these countries we live in communities we live in a village we live in a and who can compete against free right. and like I think the village where we make our skincare products, it's one of the villages in Senegal with the most uh, shoemakers in the country. Mm -hmm. We have I think, a few hundred shoemakers, each one of them hiring at least 15 something people on average. That's a lot of people. Now, when the, the day the shoe, the shoe, uh, the Tom Shoes comp, uh, truck shows up, what do you think happens to all of these people? Yeah. What do you think happens to them? Kids are like, I'm not buying. I mean, people who are buying are like, I'm not buying them. We're here with free shoes. Right. So we destroyed these jobs. So to me, it was just like, how can people not see this? I understand the first instinct of thinking you're helping, but this is not helping. But it was it's one thing to tell people it's not working and why it's not working, but maybe give them a right. chance to participate. Because when so, somebody's buying a Tom Yeah. Oh no, I, I, I get that. And so I guess, you know, a, a question you in in the book you discuss a bit, uh, John Mackey, the co founder of Whole Foods, who is uh, or the, you know, emeritus uh, chairman, co-founder of, of Whole Foods, who's talked about conscious capitalism, where he believes that capitalism has moved beyond or should move beyond uh, kind of the arguments that Milton Friedman explicitly was making in the early 70s that, um, you know, that the on, only responsibility of a company is to the bottom line of its shareholders to increase investor value. And he says, you know, that that's not quite right. You participate in that. And so with something like Skin is Skin, um, how much is it you create a product which can stand alone, you know, that is a really good product that is sold at a price that it can command? And then how do you factor in, like, there is a mission there? And people, you know, and I, I think John is absolutely correct about this. Lots of people are willing to, you know, part of what goes into the price they're willing to pay is the larger sensibility or mission of a company um you know with skin and skin products how much of it is like okay this product if you didn't know you know if it didn't have a wrapper on it or something like that would people still be buying it how much of it is joining a movement through your consumption patterns and things like that and could you talk a little bit about um you know how that plays into the uh, uh the mission that you're pursuing here right okay so, Nick, I think the best way to, uh, and maybe I'm just going to, uh, for people listening, because I do know that uh, maybe some of your audience might be biased against uh, conscious capitalism, because I, mm -hmm. I see it all the time. I just came back from a, a conference in London when uh, people on stage were completely bashing conscious capitalism, not understanding what I think, um, mm -hmm. I think not understanding what it is. So let me maybe just make that differentiation sure. for people listening to us, because I think it's important. Um you know, the problem with the concept of conscious capitalism is that um, uh, you can say the same words, but depending on where you're where where you're taking your cues from, it might mean something very different. So 
conscious capitalism, a lot of uh, people I know on the libertarian side really kind of make fun of it. And, um, you know, some people on the conservative side also make fun of it. Um, they make fun of the conscious part of conscious capitalism when we say conscious capitalism. Mm -hmm. And also some of them flat out have an adverse reaction to it. And I think for them, they're having an, an adverse reaction to it because they're understanding conscious capitalism the way the philosophers would think of it. And the way the philosophers would think of conscious capitalism is very different from us, you know, people like John or me who call ourselves bleeding, bleeding heart libertarians. We are people who came from the left. Uh, we don't reject um, the desires of the left to see a more fair, you know, society, a society where, you know, our weakest are still, you know, taken into account, where our minorities are not left to, to suffer. We still believe in those, in those, in those, in those principles of life and that's still part of a philosophy so so but the problem is when so people like us we still are cap we are capitalists still we still believe in the markets in order to solve our problems any problem um but the what the philosophers understand for them um you know uh, conscious capitalism is this concept where Yes, we're going to use uh, business supposedly to tackle um, problems, including social problems. But the way they understand it is um, the state has a say in it, mm -hmm. has a say in how the business is actually going to use its practices to actually push for, uh, you know, a better a better world. And uh, mm -hmm. the best way to think of maybe those people's theory is ESG. ESG very mm -hmm. much, you know, it's... A, it's a manifestation of that viewpoint, which I can understand. I'm a big, big um, against uh, ESGs uh, mm -hmm. as they stand. But uh, what ESG is trying to, the, the, the end goal that ESG is trying to solve, I am still on board. I still believe that it's a good, it's a good thing to protect Mother Earth whenever possible. As a matter of fact, she's one of the stakeholders of con unconscious capitalism. So I still believe in all of that. But where we differ mm -hmm. is how it works. The conscious capitalists who think, who are more your your philosopher type, they think the state should have a role in that. So the state should a come up with the issue of the day, and also come up with how it's going to be taken care of, how how your business is going to take care of that. So maybe impose more tariffs, maybe impose more more licensing, maybe impose all types of things supposedly to end on the good um, on the good um, result of having helped solve the problem. Where the conscious capitalist, a la John Mackey, a la mm -hmm. Michael Strong, a la me, by the way, they co founded uh, Conscious Capital, right. Michael and John. Yes, and, and, and Michael so, is your husband. Michael is my husband, for yes. disclosure. So the way we all look at this is it is, we believe that business is the greatest force for good, mm -hmm. beyond just hiring people and all that's the greatest force for good. And we believe that um, uh, as a business, uh, and as an entrepreneur, as somebody who's going to start a business, we believe that um, if you basically that we but but it is not anybody's to decide on the issue of the day. You, my God, the entrepreneur. You, Nick, the entrepreneur. You decide what is your issue of the day. Mm -hmm. If um, and also it as the and customer, you, right? Yes, the and as a customer, customer you decide. To decide yeah. that's, that's where it's going to that's where it's going to come yeah. in the customer. So, but you, you start. You wake up and you're like, I'm I'm fed up with mm -hmm. um, the fact that. And this is a great company, for example, Televerde. It's a conscious capitalist business. Televerde out of Arizona, I believe, they basically are very upset with the fact that um, after you have been incarcerated, you have paid your due to, dues to society, you went to jail, you spent your time, you did your thing. Especially here, they focus on women. And because they've been previously incarcerated, they come out and most of these companies, when you go in, there's a box you have to check. Right. Have you been previously incarcerated? And then the truth is when... And you have to answer the truth because, you know, you're under oath. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, most people, when they see that, I'm sorry, but consciously or not, it's vertical selection. They pass on you. Right. That's not fair. That's not fair. I believe in redemption. People deserve a second and a third chance if they show up for it. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, it's it's denied to them. Denied to them. So here you have a founder of Televerda, Televerda who says this is wrong. So this person could continue and maybe doing uh, some policy reform work at the state mm -hmm. level all they want. That's fine. Maybe they're doing it. But they said, we believe with business, we can get there faster. Mm -hmm. Let us show that there is nothing wrong with previously incarcerated people by hiring them, mm -hmm. having a thriving business from it and all of that. And people who actually support those values. And that's the mm -hmm. other word, value. See, they talk about profit. But for us, it's about value maximization. 
-hmm. And of course, if you maximize value, it's the profit will just follow eventually. It's the timeline that you're looking at that might be different. So in this case, they came, this company said, we are the, our way of ban the box is we're not going to ask. We're going to ban the box at our own level, and we're not going to wait for anybody to do this. And then they did that, and guess what? We presented this at Conscious Capital. They were talking about what they do, because that's what we do during the summit. People mm -hmm. talk about what they've been doing, what's their issue of the day, and how they're using their business to really push the agenda forward and not wait for anyone. We're not going to wait for the state to ban the box. Yeah. We're going to do it ourselves right now in business. And guess what? Now many companies are buying into buy, ban yeah. the box. So that, and at some <clears throat> it, that's a cheetah, a cheetah mentality, right? Where you don't, that's a cheetah you don't wait. We don't uh, wait. Let we me, don't wait. Um, as um, we wrap up, I wanted to ask uh, a question. We, did, we didn't really get to it, uh, but you know, the life story that you tell is fascinating. You were born in Senegal. Your parents moved to Europe for economic opportunities. At a certain point, you were brought to Germany, then Paris uh, and France, and then you came to the United States. Um, can you talk a bit um, about what it is like to be part of a diaspora? Um, because that is, you know, many, many people are part of different diasporas. There's an African diaspora, there's an Irish diaspora, which is massive. There are far more people of Irish descent living outside of Ireland than there were in, you know, in the country in 1841 and things like that. Um, talk a little bit about the benefits and the, the costs of being part of a diaspora, if you would. Well, I like to say that diaspora people, we're in a way, we're mutants. We're mutants because... Mm -hmm. And uh, we bring good things, so we bring things that are not maybe so good. So basically, the best way to think about diaspora is um, think about, you know, um, we are the ones who actually got to go and see something else. Uh, but as as what as when it is, whenever it is the case, it means that uh, you're going to mute. Okay. Some some uh, mutation is going to start to happen, right? And uh, somehow you're going to come up with this interesting mix where you decide what you keep from your original traditions, roots, mm -hmm. and all of that, and you also surely pick up along the way from the other, from your host uh, nation, your host mm -hmm. culture. And cross pollination starts to happen, and it makes for a very um, different person. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's a better person; it's a it's a worse per off person. It's just a different person. It mutated. Right. Sometimes it can be for better. Sometimes it can be for worse. It depends. But um, that's what we are. Because, and for me, I explained it in the book. I think um, it's uh, people who have been in the diaspora more, like uh, me. We need to remember that and remember that we belong. To, we are basically um, a mutant species in a way, mm -hmm. if I can say that. Way. Um, because we cannot claim to be, in my case, I cannot claim to be 100% Senegalese. Mm -hmm. Most, I mean, yeah, I'm 100% Senegalese. My two parents are from Senegal. They actually even had the same name before even being married. And it's not the same, not because we have the same tribe or anything, but it is what it is. Yeah. So you can say I'm a 100% what, you know? Yeah. So in our case, um, I try to tell people, you you have to remember that and have um, the, the, the humility of what that means. And humility doesn't mean that again, it's a bad thing, but it's just yeah. being humble to recognize that you're not 100% Senegalese, you're not 100% French in my case, you're not 100% uh, American, because I also hold those citizenships. Mm -hmm. I am just something different. Mm -hmm. And, but most importantly, my role is to try, because I'm different, because I'm a mutation between both, I now my role and my my duty becomes to be a bridge, a bridge mm -hmm. between two societies that might not otherwise understand each other better. And mm -hmm. my role is to, as whenever I go back and forth to either side, to bring to the other side the very best of the side I left behind that they don't know of, especially. So that's the role of a diaspora. Yeah. That's what being a diaspora means. That's uh, for me. fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, what is the Atlas Network and uh, what do you do for them to promote or how are they promoting prosperity in Africa? Yeah. So the Atlas Network is the largest organization of free market think tanks in the world. Um, so everywhere around the world, you see a free market think tank. They're there. And what what I love about Atlas Network. So in the in the in the freedom movement, my my love for them has to do with the fact that they're the ones who very much focus on international issues and um, international. And not to say that you know. Being focused on the U.S. or in Europe is not a good thing. Um, being focused on the U.S. is not a good thing. That's not what I'm saying. But what, but um, 
it gets plenty of support where them, they really made it that international is a big, big, big part of what they do. Um, so that's my first, um, my first, uh, you know, vote of appreciation for Atlas Network. The other thing I love about Atlas Network is um, that unlike so many places, they, going back, they don't decide the issue of the day. For them, it's about where, you know, about depending the principles of freedom, understanding that, you know, it's all to serve human flourishing. And that's another thing, too. I feel like with them, I really hear this concept of human flourishing. They're the ones, I'm telling you, the left has abandoned us. The left has abandoned the poor. And places like, you know, um, uh, Atlas Network has not abandoned us. They're there. And more, more importantly, they're working with us on our own terms. When Atlas you know, invest in a partner, that's what we call the think tanks that, you know, we work with. When they invest in them, it's not Atlas imposing the agenda on them, like it is the case with so many right. nonprofits out there. And or the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank organizations. Like exactly. That. Especially those guys. Mm -hmm. So Atlas says, Atlas, basically, somebody from, let's say, Africa, because the Center for African Prosperity focuses on Africa, that's where I'm at. So somebody from Africa decides to start a think tank or has a think tank that they would like to grow, or they have a project that they would like, or an initiative they would like to run within their think tank. Then they come to us and they say, this is, a pro this is, this is our views on this as this is our views on prosperity, on, on um, freedom in, um, in my country. And um, we believe that uh, there is a, something we can do about it. Like I'll take, for example, um, uh, the Great Lake, the, um, we have um, this, uh, uh, the name is escaping me right now, but uh, it's an organization, the ones we invite, we invest in in, um, in Burundi. Mm -hmm. And so they came up this one time and they said, look, um, you know, women's uh, property rights are not being respected. The best way for it to be to happen is to have it be part of a constitution. So eventually they had a pro they had an initiative to make that happen and we financed them. It was not it was not us saying, you know, like you had to work on these issues. They came with their issue and they came with a plan and we financed them. And then, of course, you know, they report back and how it worked. But I think that, Nick, might be overlooked by many, but it's not lost on me because when you're African, meaning you belong to you belong to the economically dominated uh, part of the world. Uh, it's not lost on us because when you're economically weak, uh, the rest of the world decide, uses it to actually have you become a pawn for their own agenda. Maybe, and, and you can say, maybe it's not wrong because everybody, they say states and nations have no friends. They only have interests. Right. So if because I'm weak, they get to move their interests further, the conscious captains in me might say, it's not smart for you to do it this way. Have it win, 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 and it will be better, mm -hmm. but not everybody's going to behave that way. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are. And so we are, we are being told all the time what to do. We're being told all the time what to believe. Uh, when you look at the energy situation, it's the same thing. The West some, some all of a sudden decides fossil fuels, no more good. We have to go cold turkey overnight almost in the, in, in, in the, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things. And um, they're out there trying to promote, uh, trying to push that agenda down our throat. If it was just promoting it, even then you could say fine, but it's like pushing it literally down our throat. And if we don't even buy into it, they will have a, the means to enforce it. Because thousands of miles away, through the World Bank, through the IMF, through all of these organizations, they decide to actually act on this agenda by not financing the, the, the development of a fossil fuels-based um, infrastructure. And they will use ESG as their, you know, uh, principled and philosophy to support all of this stuff. Mm. And so we have absolutely nothing to say. Compare that to China. And India, who, because they're doing much better than us, get to tell them, F off, mm -hmm. F off, get out of our way. We can't. And even if we tell them, get out of our way, two things are going to happen to us. One is that leader is probably going to be in trouble because they'll find a way to get him in trouble. And two, they're still going to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing here is um, that's, that's what, um, so Atlas really um, gives a chance to the partners that we invest in, give them a chance to set the agenda. And most importantly, uh, execute on that agenda. And I appreciate that very much. And um, this makes me remember something that I am really big on these days, Nick. Hmm. Something is going on that I don't think we're paying attention enough to. 
And I think I know why we're not paying attention to this, but let me tell you what's going on. And I really would like for the libertarians to wake up because I am appalled at how quiet they have been about this. In a tiny country in Latin America, great disaster is about to happen. So, as you know, many countries have signed the New York, you know, the New York Treaty Arbitration, which is all about we are going to respect international arbitrations, mm -hmm. meaning we don't expropriate people, meaning, you know, when something is signed, we respect it. Now, um, as you can Im imagine, many, Afri many um, Latin American nations are part of it. You know, Central American, CAFTA, are part of CAFTA, you know, the CAFTA, yeah. Central American Trade. Yeah. So anyway, so a country like Honduras has signed that. So they're supposed to respect that. A country like Honduras, and you could imagine this to be almost any country in Africa. And that's a reason why I talk about it, because to me, it's going to be very interesting to see how America decides to settle on this. So you have an organization that has done a startup cities there, mm -hmm. Prosper. Right. Okay. So since the new government took over, it seems like their big plan is to renegade on, you know, having signed such a treaty mm -hmm. because of some issues they might have with Prospera. But again, regardless, for me, it's like you signed a deal. You said you're going to be part of a New York treaty that is going to support this. Now, when you have crazy governments trying to do whatever they're trying to do, me, I'm sitting there and once again saying, Governments do what they do, but the people stand to suffer. Hmm. The people of Honduras deserve better. I think I hear it from all of them saying they want prosperity because last time I checked, no one wants to live continue in, in poverty. So when you have a startup cities, for all the reasons I explained earlier, what the role and goal of a startup cities is, is to bring, um, you know, the enabling environment that businesses, aka wealth creators, need in order to create wealth. They show up and they're going to do their mm -hmm. work. And then all of a sudden, because of ideological reasons, you're going to say, we don't want to support this. We're going to and in, 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 in doing that, we're actually going to do something that um, is going to renegade on our um, on our um, commitment to the concept of rule of law. Right. This is a problem. And it would if it was just that side doing it, um, the government's there. You know, there's a reason why our, gov our government there is a, there is a reason why our countries are where they are. Mm -hmm. We all know why. So startup cities actually offer these countries a chance to still attract international investors because they're saying, OK, on your own, we, we don't really trust what's going on because you're not mm -hmm. offering the best business environment. Reason why you don't want to come. But you managed to carve out an area where we can we can do this. So we're coming. It would be one thing that you have uh, governments who have other priorities do this to themselves. But it's another thing to me, Nick, when you have someone like Senator Warren, hmm. and I'm using her name, Senator Warren, people like Cory Bush, and people like Bernie Sanders, siding with um, a government, in this case, the government of Honduras, helped by a government like Venezuela, helped like by a government like Cuba, about... Basically, Senator Warren said it is okay to expropriate U.S. investors hmm. in this case. That's a letter that she championed. The U.S. government right now is telling the Honduran government it is okay for you to renegade on rule of law. Hmm. It is okay for you to renegade on the Treaty of New York that you signed and also on the CAFTA um, you know, terms that you signed on. This is a terrible precedent. If something like this goes, it's not just Prospera that suffers mm -hmm. this time. And by the way, Prospera will go and do something else somewhere else. This, mm -hmm. this, this idea, these ideas are uh, ideas for our time. It will be done somewhere. It's just a matter of time and we're working on it. I'm definitely taking this to Africa. Mm -hmm. But my point is, we all don't have to be super smart people to imagine what something like this will do to the government of Honduras, even if and when Prospera is gone. No one, no one is going to want to invest in, in, in Honduras anymore. Right. Meanwhile, we have the same Senator Warren 
opening her big mouth, screaming all over the earth. Her and the, the you know, being saying, uh, when it comes to the um, immigration issue, I say, Senator Warren, do you not know what solves immigration? Do you not? Because by doing what you're doing, get ready to be, uh, to, for all Hondurans to keep coming. You think, you thought you had caravans before? Soon it's going to be, you know, <laughs> more than caravans. Yeah. Because if people are not able to accomplish prosperity on their land, people are going to know what people should do. I don't blame immigrants for trying to leave where they are to go to a better place. It's not ideal. It's not recommended. But my parents had to do it. And many more after them did it and will continue doing it. This is what humans do. Your ancestors did that, Nick, when they came to this country. Absolutely. Many other ancestors. Okay? So if Senator Warren, I think she needs to hear it from us. We don't want her sanctuary cities. Thank you very much. We don't want the sanctuary cities. You want the charter cities. Yes. Yeah. We want the startup cities. Mm -hmm. We want the startup cities yeah. where we can thrive, where we can build life at home, where we can check out our babies in the backyard, you know, get to, we turn around, we see them. Where grandmas and, 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 and grandchild get to live together and be raised together. That's what we want. Given a chance, most of us would not want to, would not need to be at your shores at the border. We would not. We never would. So, Senator Warren, are you in for a real deal or not? And I am calling her out specifically. This is, I don't even know what to, it, I'm just so, I'm so sad, Nick. When I'm not upset, I'm very sad. Because this is what they have done. And you remember when you were telling me about the aid earlier? While they're doing this, the World Bank getting ready nicely to sign a $900 million, $900 million uh, aid package for Honduras. And then people wonder, they're like, then, you know, they say, my God, you write this book and you say we need an enabling business environment, but it's going to be up to these governments to do it. And if they don't want to do it, what can we do? Because we're America, whatever. What do you want us to do? To intervene? I'm like, no, no, that's not what I'm asking for. But when, but when it's happening and you, the government, have nothing better to do than to support this thuggish behavior, we have a problem. And when also on top of that, you're using your arms like the World Bank, the IMF and places like that to reward almost bad behavior, we've got a problem. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think your $900 million aid package is going to do that it hasn't done over these past few years? What? What? What do you think that kicking out people who have attracted hundreds of businesses in this area, building all of these jobs, what do you think is going to happen once you kick them out and on top of that you send a signal to everybody that you're not safe to invest in? The wealth creators are going to leave or they're not going to come and the poverty is going to stay and people are going to try to escape the poverty. It means they're going to come to your, to your border. But maybe that's what you wanted, Senator Warren. Maybe that's what you need from us. Maybe the only thing you need from us is to be a political pawn. Because maybe if there was not an immigration crisis, maybe a lot of your election, your voters would simply not even listen to you. Maybe that's all you care about us. But if that's the case, we're going to have to put it on the table and be real about this. I'm sick and tired of this, Nick. This needs to change. I'm sick and tired of the lip service we're being paid. Because on one end, they say, oh, um, we don't want to intervene. Yeah, I don't want you to intervene. But you're intervening and in the most pervasive way. So what are we doing? What are the libertarians doing? What is everybody doing? What is anybody who believes in the rule of law doing? That's a question for you, Nick. All right. What are we doing? Well, I know that Reason Foundation is going to be having a uh, conference at Prospera uh, next year, among other things. So we're look, you know, supporting startup cities and uh, and exploring what works and what doesn't. Uh, we are going to end it there. Uh, Magat Wade, thanks so much for talking to Reason. The new book is The Heart of a Cheetah. How have, we been, how we have been lied to about African poverty and what that means for human flourishing. Magat, thanks so much for talking. Thank you so much, Nick. It was a pleasure.